Well, here we are, folks. Welcome. And uh, another Tuesday evening. And this time we're going to talk about property and particularly Brisbane property. And I've got to Megan uh, teed up, ready to go in just a moment. We'll just run this for a moment or two to uh, give people a chance to uh, come in. And uh, good to see everybody on the uh, on the chat. Uh, hi to um, quite a few of the old faithfuls, if I can call them that, and a uh, few a uh, few new ones too. So it's um, great to see you all here. Um, Jason, how are you going? Good to see you, and uh, quite a few others too. I might just uh, pick a. <laughs> it's Mr. North. Well, I don't know about Mr. North. You can call me call me what you like. I get called a lot worse on the YouTube. Uh, <laughs> chat <laughs> hi Aaron how you going <laughs> hi Paul good to see you there as well and uh, ah cookie boy thinks avocado is disgusting yes well it's funny you know very polar I think you either love it or hate it um, cookie boy also says please smash the like button yeah please do really does help you know because um, the more people like the post the more widely it gets dis uh, dis uh, distributed and therefore more people see it um, a lot of other questions too a lot of other observations but I won't uh, touch them now I'll come back shortly because I'd like to get on with the main show now and to do that let me just run the intro and then um, we'll get on with uh, the full show so just stand by a moment Hello, good evening and welcome to the live stream on the 14th of September 2021. Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics here. Great to have you all on board. And uh, we're in for a treat tonight. We're going to go and look at Brisbane property in some detail. And boy, there's a lot to talk about there. To what with property prices continuing to rise, a lot of interstate activity of interest, a lot of Zoom auctions. Uh, and uh, also some interesting um, differences between high rise, low rise and in different suburbs. So a lot to explore. But I think we can also extrapolate quite a lot of what's going on locally in Brisbane to the broader market, too. Just before I bring uh, Megan in, let me just uh, run through my normal uh, caveats. This isn't uh, financial or legal advice. This is just a general conversation about property and uh, things surrounding property. If you need specific advice, then uh, go find a buyer's agent. If you might know a few from uh, these channels, uh, or indeed, um, uh, if you need legal advice, go find a lawyer. But or financial advice, a financial advisor. We don't really provide specific advice here. Please do play nice in the chat room. No racial slurs. This is as at the 14th of September 21. If you want to get my attention, use at Walk the World. Uh, that means that uh, I'll be more likely to see your question. I will say that there is a lot of stuff that goes on in the chat. Sometimes I do miss things. I apologise if I do. And uh, if you um, want to contact me afterwards via the DFA blog, if I didn't answer your question, you can do that. I have enabled Super Chat, which means that you can get your question top of the list, but also make a contribution if you'd like to, to help us with what we do here, because uh, it does cost a bit to run all these things, and uh, every sent helps and with that let me now push this button and bring uh, megan in megan are you there i am hello martin how are you tonight yeah good how are you going fabulous we're up here in sunny brisbane and it's been a beautiful 24 degree day um couldn't be happier yeah i love your bright background it's uh, really yeah, it really does you know uh, where that is that, that's, that's south bank yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I've yeah. walked. I've walked past that particular um, set of letters, right? I've actually even taken some photographs and videos because uh, right. it's just perfect. In fact, if if you were to watch the uh, stream, um, you know, the sort of the pre-stream, uh, in fact, it um, uh, does show that particular view as one of the options. Oh well, yeah, I chose well then. <laughs> yeah, you did choose very well. How lucky was that? <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. And look, it's thank you very much for spending uh, a bit of time tonight talking about Brisbane property. A lot to talk about, of course. Thanks for having me back. Um, so it's lovely uh, to have a chat. Yeah, and uh, what we might do, just 
for people who may not know, why don't you just introduce yourself and uh, uh, basically explain a little bit about what you do. I just, you've got so many irons in the fire, so many things you do <laughs> that are probably related that it'll be easier if you tell the story rather than me try and tell it. I may, might miss one or two, but let's give it a go. Um, Martin, I guess the reason you have me on here is that I'm, I'm feet on the ground in Brisbane and, and my job is really to know the property market inside out. And it's one of the things that I really love about what we do is, is as buyer's agents, we put the feet on the ground and, and we apply some of what you do in terms of the analytics, but we, we, we put it in front of people and we, we make it real for them. Finding houses and matching matching those with our clients is I guess the big thing for Property Pursuit and that's the buyer's agency side of my business. I also have a business with Veronica Morgan who is very well known buyer's agent in Sydney. Uh, and we, a few years ago, sort of lamented the fact that a lot of first time buyers couldn't um, get access to, to, to buyer's agents. So we did a, we developed a, an online course, Home Buyer Academy, your first home buyer guide, and and um, we're really, you know, it's a real passion project for us. So we're working a lot with first home buyers as well as you know all all sorts of people in terms of buyers um, across all price ranges. Um, I guess you know, at the end of the day, I guess you call me a bit of a property tragic that has a bit of a people spin. So I like putting those two things together, and that, that's what makes my life enjoyable. <laughs> well, and, and you know what I find fascinating is I come at it from the sort of the analytics and, and trying to understand from a data perspective. And you know, mm. I've got realised that I've had to speak to more and more people about what they're thinking because you have to understand the psychology and you've got to understand yeah, yeah. what people people are trying to do right yeah. you come a bit the other way from from there on the ground seeing everything right but actually yeah. coming together and thinking about some of these things i think it's quite powerful and uh, you know people like veronica and uh, chris bates and a few others that, that i have on mm. um because you know Great property minds out there but there's, yeah. there's also a lot of people that can really put those those things together and 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 really bring them down to a, a simplistic level that people can understand and i think that's our role is um, you know, you and I can talk about statistics and, and what's happening with interest rates and all these sorts of things. But at the end of the day, most people want to know how it affects them. Um, and that's the thing that I really like to do is kind of talk them through and walk them through, through that journey of how does, how does all this impact you and what does it yeah, mean? Absolutely. And, you know, it's the biggest decision probably you're ever going to make when you're going to buy, buy property these days, right? Because it's so expensive. And, and the problem, of course, heard, is... Uh, I think you... On one of your recent shows, you, you talked about the fact that most people spend more time researching buying a car or a boat than they spend uh, researching to buy a house or spend actually yep. you know, looking that, that to was buy a, a house. And, that that know, was can that, style research, the, yeah. Yeah, the yeah. diversity of, of, of how vast the difference is between how much they're spending on those three different categories of things yep. Yep. um it's you know it's pretty pretty alarming but you're right it is probably the biggest financial investment most people will make in their life <laughs> and look my, my view is i'm trying to be a bit of an antidote to all the spruiking that's going on out there right because <laughs> I, i'm not anti-property i believe it i'm not and i i do think that just come at it differently yeah yeah you know the fact is that if you buy the right piece of property at the right time then you can do very well but the trouble is there are traps for the unwary and unfortunately if people just get swept up in the um you know the psychology of the auction or buying a property sight unseen without actually doing any due diligence there are huge risks involved and of course the amounts of money we're talking about are a massive right right you know you might um, think of buying a boat or a car or something and you know spend a bit of time on the internet but the fact that Canstar said people buying property spend less time <laughs> that's just scary it's, it's funny that you say that because we, we're going to go into that a little bit later the whole sight unseen thing because it, it makes me choke um <laughs> but you know that's that's another story there are ways to do it and there are ways not to do it and, and we'll talk about that we'll unravel that a little bit later um but uh I think I think that one of the um the Canstar survey and, and I got this off, uh, off off one of your shows. 11% uh, would buy a house sight unseen versus 8% would buy a pet sight unseen. So more people would buy a house sight unseen than a pet. Yes. <laughs> Scary stuff. I mean, I know a pet can bite, but you know, the point is probably can bite, right? If you if you buy the wrong property. Well, we can absolutely bite. You know, that, that, whole, that whole old saying, and I don't know where it came from, but it should be shelved, that old saying that, you know, as long as you buy anything, you'll make money in property. Like, no, no. There are so many people who have lost money in property, so many people who have really done their dough and have either had to start all over again from a lesser position than they were before they went into the property or the opportunity cost of what they purchased versus what they should have purchased has actually set them back a, a number yep. of years. 
Yeah, and the, so, that concept. Yeah, it's not not just any property. Yeah. Spot on. No, <laughs> exactly right. Later. You've got to do the. And that concept of the opportunity cost, right? Which is, in other words, if you didn't buy X but you bought Y, mm. or if you didn't buy now but bought later, that that's the stuff that people actually often don't get their head around. The other thing, of course, is that once you've bought a property, um, you're sort of committed to it, and then you've got you've got the ongoing upkeep costs and the maintenance mm. costs and everything else and if it's an investment property you've got to investing is not an easy well, it's not an easy answer to a difficult situation a lot of people don't realize how badly they've done until they actually sell the property yeah you know, that's absolutely. the proof that's in the pudding you yeah. can cry all you like about you know I own this property and I've done this and <laughs> and you know a lot of young young people that have leverage leverage to the eyeballs not only young, older people too, um, leverage the eyeballs saying, you know, I'm very successful, in, I'm a successful property investor because I've got five, six, seven properties. But it, they won't realise what sort of impact they've had on themselves and their wealth until they actually divest. So that's really the proof is in the pudding when you actually sell. So um, unless you've had that proof, then... Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit hard to listen to someone who's well, I, I was making, five, make, five I was making a show last night with uh, Edwin, who's a, a, a yeah. guy that I work with in Sydney, right? And I talked Edwin's about, brand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he does golf a bit. But the point is, I talked about what I call a punctiliar action. That's a particular yep. type of action, right? Which is a point mm -hmm. in time, but it has a massive consequence subsequent, right? And, and track, yeah. buying Ten property years. is a punctiliar action because mm -hmm. the decisions you take today are fundamentally going to impact not just the next few months, you know, next year, but you know, a long time down the track. People just sometimes don't think about it like that. And I sometimes think mm. that uh, if they did, they might be just a little more cautious and get a little bit more information and uh, perhaps make better decisions. Do you know one of the things that we, uh, Veronica and I, in, in sort of researching and pulling together Home Buyer Academy, that one of the things that we really, really got quite concerned about was how much people don't know what they don't know. And I think that's the big knowledge gap that we have the most fear about is you don't know what you don't know until it's actually unveiled to you. And, and, the, and the biggest problem with property in Australia, particularly in Queensland, is the basis of property law is caveat emptor, which is literally let the buyer beware. And, and what that means is people have to know what they need to know in order to find the answers to the questions that they don't yet know that they need to answer. Now, wrap your head around that in Queensland. <laughs> <laughs> there's no there's little or no seller disclosure yeah. Yeah. um and you have to as a buyer you are the person who has to go and find out every single thing about that property you can't rely on the agent to tell you you can't rely on a solicitor to, to do searches under unless you instruct them um so if you don't know what you don't know you need to you know be engaging with you know either a really reputable and experienced buyer's agent or really skill yourself up in what you need to find out how you need to find it out and, and how to analyze the information once you get it Sorry, well, I go off on little tangents. No, 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 like no, that no. That, that, that's really important, that. right? Because um, I don't know whether it's the same in Queensland, but in New South Wales, the um, vendor might well provide a survey, for example, right? Or they might provide some other information, right? And people mm -hmm. sort of take that as gospel. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, the evidence certainly in New South Wales is that those surveys aren't worth the paper they're written on, partly because of all the caveats that they include in them, but partly because they tend to be sort of spun and twisted, right? And yet a lot of people rely on that particular information set uh, mm -hmm. to, to guarantee to that the they're actually, yeah. So you've got to assume nothing. You've got to assume you've got to find out yourself, right? And, and that can be everything from pests the structure of the property, building uh, strata reports, if that's planning, you know, zoning, all those things, exactly. right? Exactly. Uh, improvements. If there's been decks put on a property, have they actually been approved? You know, is it in line with building code? Is it current code? Is it old code? Um, is the certifications in place? Is that pool in the right place? Is the overland flow? Is there flood? No one's going to tell you this in Queensland, and certainly you won't get a survey, Martin. You know that that that's you, you would just never receive that in Queensland. Um, the disclosure in Queensland is, is uh, I think it's, uh, is there a smoke alarm? Is there a um, safety certificate? Uh, is there a pool safety certificate? No, is there a safety switch? Is there a pool safety certificate? Um, any QCAT disputes? And unless it's, you know, if it's a freehold house, it's, that's about it, really. Yeah. That's what the seller's got to disclose. They, they have to disclose any registered easements, but they don't have to disclose unregistered age, easements. Now, if you don't know what an unregistered easement is and how to find it out, you could end up with a property that has a sewer running through it right where you want to put your pool. 
Yep. No one's got to disclose that to you. Yep, absolutely. You've got yes. to find it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you find out the hard way, right? When you sort of build that pool and think, oh, water's a bit funny colour. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when the pool company goes, now I've done the plan and apparently there's a sewer two metres <laughs> down. <laughs> Oh, great. Now, let's just uh, get there's a question here from Dead and Regret. And thanks very much for the super chat, Dead and Regret. Due to COVID lockdowns in Sydney and Melbourne, does Megan see this feeding property prices in Brisbane and South East Queensland substantially? And I'll add to that, um, what is the interstate interest, right? Because we know that the ABS showed a lot of interstate migration, so net migration positive towards Queensland mm -hmm. and particularly Brisbane and the South East. So we know that there's significant momentum that way. Um, so what mm -hmm. are you seeing? Is that, how true is this uh, interstate interest and what's it, what is it doing to the market? Okay, I'll let you do the stats, but I did pull off a couple. Um, but feed on the ground, what we're seeing um, is that you know, normally in a normal year, let's take COVID out of it, in a normal year, about two thirds of our clients who are buying are local and the balance are interstate or expat buyers. And usually expat buyers are buying perhaps a house to move back to or an investment property to get some money into Australia. But currently that that's really sort of changed, shifted and, and there's about 20% expats about 35% interstate and 45% local. Um, so those local people are generally looking to upgrade um, or, or move out of you know the home that they were locked in last year for a few months and decided was far too small for them to exist in that kind of space anymore. Plus, of course, you can't travel at the moment. So a lot of people are, are using their homes a lot more for um, you know, socialising and so forth. So I guess, yeah, you know, the population side of things is a really interesting one because it is one of the things that does put upward pressure on prices. And it was a really good question because um, the increase uh, in population in Queensland was 1.9%, 19, 19, 19.19, 19.19, 19.20. It's the highest of all the capital cities. But actually one of the things that is also driving um, population increase is natural increases at its highest level. So there are less people dying and more people having babies. So the natural increase is actually increasing. Net migration um, is a really interesting one. And this is where the interstate interest comes in and also the expat interest. So we're not seeing any foreign buyers in, in our business or am I hearing any of that from real estate agents that we talk to? And we talk to thousands of real estate agents. But the net migration is, is the thing that's really interesting because no one, one of the big things that we used to see a lot um, with Brisbane is people leaving to work overseas or interstate, you know, that big exodus of people looking for higher paying jobs in, in you know, salary, larger firms, better uh, professional opportunities and so forth. No one's leaving Queensland at the moment to go and pursue these opportunities, to work overseas, to work interstate. But we have this influx of repatriating Australians and interstate migration from people who are realising that, in fact, they can have um, you know, the interesting thing about COVID is how people are reevaluating their working situations. So people who may have wanted to live in Queensland, they have family here or like the warmer weather or whatever the case may be, um, who would want to live anywhere else, by the way. I, I, I don't understand why you would live anywhere else. But um, you know, th th there's this reevaluation of do I really need to live in the city that I work in now because there are so many more opportunities for flex flexible working arrangements so people are looking at this now from an employment point of view and saying, well, I actually can have my lifestyle in Queensland, but still maintain my position, my professional development, my career, uh, career, career progression um, in my job in Sydney or Melbourne uh, and commute on a much less basis, maybe just be down there once a week, once a fortnight, once a month, whatever the case may be, maybe a week, a, a month, you know, there's various flexible working arrangements that are really coming out um, and becoming available to people now that are allowing them to move their families to Queensland while still maintaining their working positions interstate. That's a really interesting phenomenon because it's one of the reasons that I've always believed that that house prices in Brisbane haven't had that sort of really strong push since about 2003, I think was you know, the biggest last rush that we had in prices. We've had some peaks since then, but um, certainly not to the extent that Sydney and Melbourne have. And I think one of the main reasons is we don't get the high income positions, the, the, the corporate headquarters and so forth that, that bring people who have 
large discretionary incomes up to Brisbane to buy high-end houses and move people along, um, you know, upgrading into to houses and pushing prices up. So we haven't had that in the past. We're starting to have it now. Yeah, and it's very interesting. I think there's, um, you know, a bit of a, a sea change going on, right, with um, no migration but a lot of interstate interest. Yeah, there's, there's no just, exodus, but there's yeah. this, this, this sort of, you know, this instead of there being a revolving door here at the moment, it's <laughs> almost like the outdoor has, has been broken and, and mm. the indoor is just kind of getting pushed and pushed and pushed, and that's putting a lot of pressure on prices. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's a follow-up question which actually came from Trish beforehand, which was she's looking basically at property mm. just in and around Brisbane, right? Mm. And what she's saying is... Um, I can only look at it sort of at arm's length because I'm locked down in Sydney, right? And the estate agents are saying, no, 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 you can, we can give you the virtual tour and you can do a Zoom auction and, you know, you can participate completely virtually, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and the question that she threw at me was, what am I missing, right? Is this sensible or is this stupid? Well, <laughs> go back to those figures from the CanStar survey, don't we? Well, 11% of people... Uh, so 11% of people will buy a property sight unseen. Was that, I think that was yeah, that's correct. That's right. 11% versus 8% yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. for pets. 8% yeah. for a pet. <laughs> yeah, um, right. You know, and I've, I have heard of people travelling interstate to view the pet before the pet is available for pickup. So <laughs> oh, yes. like, I actually believe that. Um, you know, and, and I, I look, is there a place for virtual tours? Absolutely. They're fantastic. Virtual tours are a really good way for getting a feel for how a property flows and, and, and what some of the features are, the pho photography, all of those sorts of things. But look, I, I think the thing that I get really concerned about is the, the, the misconception that the agent may be working in the buyer's interest in what they present to you. So let's, let's just be honest. I'm not, I will not agent bash. It's not my job. It's not what I do. But an agent's fiduciary obligation is to sell the property and to represent the seller. They have to get the highest price for the property. That is their legal obligation. They have to present that property in a way that doesn't misrepresent the property, but features its, its most promising and, and, and lovable and emotional aspects, and then get buyers to fall in love with it and compete for that property. For, with a fear of, of losing it and someone else moving into their home that they've you know emotionally moved into and unpacked their furniture and have sat in the couch in their own head in the virtual tour. So that's, that's their job. Mm. It, is, it is, let's just be really, really clear about that. So anything that you see in marketing material is marketing material. So if you're thinking about um, having a look at something virtually, have a think about who is giving you that virtual tour. If it's not someone who's representing your interests, working on your behalf, or have, has, has you at, at the heart of, of what they're trying to show you, and knows a bit as well, whether that be family, whether it be colleagues, whether it be a, an independent buyer's agent, whoever that is, if they're not there for you and on your side, then you have to just believe that they're working for the seller and their job is to sell the property to the person who will pay the most amount of money. All right, so that's fact, that's fact. So the, the thing that I have heard is, you know, people might sort of see the kitchen and, and fall in love or they see the deck or the yard and they kind of get blinkers on and they stop looking for reasons that they shouldn't buy and they start looking for all the reason, reasons that they want to buy, you know, that confirmation bias. So I want it, therefore I see these good things. Um, you know, the only time that it's really acceptable to buy sight unseen is if you have an independent person working on your behalf because the risks are you're not going to see the hot water system. So the marketing material, the, the, the virtual walkthrough, it's not going to show you the, the, the hot water system. It's not going to show you the stumps under the house if it's a Queenslander. It's not going to open the meter box and have a look at what the electricals are. Is there any old Indian wiring in there or has it not been updated since the 1920s? Hmm, do we have electricity then? Um, I digress. <laughs> yeah, uh, you, you, know, you might not... <laughs> You might not see the, I can't remember, anyway, okay, you might not see the laundry if it's in good condition or not. You might not see, you know, a, a wall that has a hole in it because that's not good marketing material. Now, the agent's not misrepresenting the property. They are simply highlighting the good aspects of the property and the marketing material, and that's their job. You won't see what the um, roof is like, the guttering. Do the downpipes go 
into a stormwater system or they just go to ground. Now, all these sorts of things are the sorts of things when you go through a, a property yourself and you have a good checklist, they're the things you're going to be looking at and you're going to be nitpicking over them, not to talk yourself out of it, but to walk into it with open eyes because nothing's perfect. There's always going to be compromises, all those sorts of things. Um, but, you know, these are the sorts of things when you're work, walking around a property, you, it might jump out of it at you and you might notice it or you might have a bit of a checklist that makes you go, all right, well, I haven't looked or I haven't seen the back corner fence yet. Oh, wow, okay, it's a retaining wall and it's falling down. That's, that's something I really need to look into and consider what the cost might be to fix that. So these are the sorts of things when you're walking around a property or somebody's doing it for you with eyes that are intended for your benefit, you're going to see what you're not going to see in, in virtual um, tours and, and marketing photos. Now, the, the other thing I think about buying sight unseen or from interstate is it's a really, really, really different process in each state. Um, and, and one of the things we talked about is vendor disclosure. It's really different. I think Victoria has probably the most thorough vendor disclosure in um, Australia. Sydney's pretty good, but there's still things missing. Um, Queensland is shocking for vendor disclosure. As I say, there's, you really have to do know what to do, how to find it, how to interpret the information and so forth. Um, so if you've bought in Sydney and you think you're going to buy in Queensland and you don't understand what the difference in the process, you might actually apply some um, incorrect thinking and make some fairly big mistakes along the way, end up with something that you haven't thoroughly researched and could end up costing you an awful lot in the the long run or it's probably you know you could end up buying a property that you should have walked past instead of walked into mm. and virtually. of course the, and of course the point there is that one of the things to look at is are you overlooked right look at the plots yeah. around the place you know are, are they going to just knock it down and put a four story up next door or those sorts of things because mm. those are the things that you can see almost immately if when you're there but it's very hard what to are the see neighbors like yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we call them at, at Home Bar Academy. Veronica has a term: PLUs, people like you. <laughs> um, and you and you often can't get that unless you go to the coffee shops, unless you go to the shopping centre, unless you're hanging out at the park with other people's kids. Um, you should only hang out at the park if you have children yourself, of course. Uh, but do you know what I mean? Like it's 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 seeing are these people like us? Are they the kind of people that we want to hang out with on a weekend and and be around? I mean, not necessarily make friends with, but you know, are they are they your people? You can't get that kind of feeling by doing Google Maps or, no, um, you know, it's, it's, it's something that you need to experience or have someone experience for you. You can't do it in out of lockdown at the moment. You can't get into Queensland. Queensland can't even get into Queensland sometimes. Yeah. So you, you need to make sure that if you're going to do it, do it right. Mm. I'll give you one little story. Um, I was looking at a property in the UK, in fact, in a place called Cambridge, which is a, quite a famous place, right? But mm. the, um, the, the vendor was only available on a Sunday to show people around, right? And I tried to figure out why, why Sunday, right? So I went around on a Saturday and discovered that there was a, um, a, a dry cleaning centre that was running um, eight till six six days a week Monday right? to Saturday Monday <laughs> to Saturday with all of the sort of the noise and all of the fumes coming out the back right coming wafting straight over into the garden right, right. right. <laughs> so another no, another point to get when you when you look at a place don't just go the same time every time go at other other times too great advice Martin yeah well we try <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is topography so brisbane's really hilly it's it just there's a lot of hills and ups and downs and all these sorts of things and and you can be you can marketing material can make something look elevated and airy and so forth but if the hills around you are preventing airflow or natural light coming or um, we have overland flow here so we are not only have rising flood we have overland flow, which is the pathway that water takes when it comes down hilly topography. And that can affect, you can find that information free online, that's on city plan, but until you physically go and look at a property, you don't really understand how those things kind of work and you know how much is the slope on yeah. that block of land and what can I do and what can't I do. Um, going up and down the street, uh, you know, the property at the bottom of the hill is not as good as the one that's you know, on the acclivity and not as good as the one that's on the peak. So um, some of those sorts of aspects of actually being able to drive around or have someone drive around on your behalf to give you that independent look at what's around is really quite important. Yeah, and then the thing I do with my one-to-one -one conversations, what I have with people, is to look at the uh, flood maps, 
look at the crime maps, look at the development maps, right? Because you can tell quite a lot about what is going to happen by just putting those pieces of information together and also if it's appropriate fire, for example, as well. So, mm -hmm. you know, th yeah. there's, there's research that you can do. Just picking up on the Zoom question, right? Zoom auctions, right? Which is a yeah. big thing at the moment. Um, and picking up what Trish said, you know, quite ne she was quite nervous about the whole concept of mm. a Zoom mm. auction, you know. Am I going to see the same as I would if I was there? Can I read the rest of the audience? I mean, a bit tricky, isn't it? It is hard. And, um, and I don't think... Uh, so I'm going to separate the, the types of auctions. There's online auctions that are actually held online. And some of those you, you don't see anybody else. And some of them are actually run on the major portals with a, a date and a time um, and people place bids during the marketing campaign and the price actually goes up and you see the price yep. going up but it gets to the end date and that doesn't or time and that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to sell you don't really know what the reserve was people might have conditions they're, they're quite a you know i find them quite a confusing process we, we've bid on a few of them and it's i still still scratch my head um <laughs> zoom auctions if we if we kind of decide that the way that we're going to um uh what we're going to say a zoom auction is is a traditional auction where the auctioneer is standing up in front but instead of the audience being physically there in front of the auctioneer um there's sort of a whole heap of faces on zoom if we call that a zoom auction yeah look there's a it feels a little bit more real and it feels a little bit more traditional the auctioneer is there they're calling the bids but um, in, in a lot of cases, you actually can't see the other people. In some cases, you can. So it depends how the company is actually going to run the online option. Um, and then there's others where it's just you can't see anybody. You're just typing in your bids and the auctioneer is calling it and you put your hand up and you bid. And um, there's all sorts of different ways. And I, I actually bid on my first online auction in 2009. So we're, we're, we're talking, you know, it was very new technology back then. Um, it didn't take off at that time. I, I found it, I honestly didn't feel that it benefited, benefited the seller nor the buyer. I, I thought it was an awful process for both parties. Um, it's, it's kind of an imperative now because we physically can't get into auction rooms or on site for auctions. So there's a bit of pivoting and tilting and there's probably better technology now to do it. Um, but I don't think that I've necessarily seen a platform that is... Now, auctions are meant to work for the seller. The idea is to, to gather a whole heap of bidders together and get them to bid unconditionally under a high-pressure situation and get people to experience the emotions of fear of loss and ego, I need to win this, so that people actually start you know, really going for it against each other to push out, to, to, to actually get the highest price out of the buyers. That's really what the, the, the basics of an auction psychology are. And a good agent, a good auctioneer can do that really well. You know, a, a, a well-informed buyer, a buyer's agent can step back from that and, and sort of you know, take the heat out of that. You can't really do that with online auctions. Yeah. So you don't, the owner, the seller doesn't get the benefit of that emotion and the ego and the, you know, all of that sort of thing that comes from being in an auction situation. Um, and the buyer doesn't kind of get caught up in that either. Um, so it's, yeah, I just don't, I haven't, personally haven't seen it be particularly um, successful, but it's, I guess it's just a product of where we are at the moment that they've, they've got to exist. Mm, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I've, I would be nervous if I hadn't yeah. done one before. I'd, I'd, you know, what I've, we always recommend, um, as part of the course, we always recommend go to a number of auctions, physically yeah. go to another a number of auctions, watch how things are done, watch how auctioneers do things, watch how agents do things, watch how buyers buyers behave, arm yourself with information. You know, read Veronica's book, get auction ready. Um, make sure you know what this whole thing is about because it is a psychological process and it is a very, very structured process that is put in place for a very specific reason and that is to get the highest price of the property. Um, but you have to stop yourself. You have to, you have to have that control to be able to say, I've set my limit before the auction. I'm not going beyond it and, and I'm completely comfortable with, with where I'm going to walk away. So there are things you can control as a buyer and that is your actions and, and how you bid. But we say physically go to auctions. Right now I'd be saying just 
register for online auctions. Just get in, yep. see how they work, see what you can see, what you can't see, how our agent's handling it, how our auction is handling it. Get on, just be part of it. You know, register for as many as you like. It doesn't cost you anything to register. Yep. Um, just don't bid. Don't bid. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Don't end up with a probably didn't actually mean, mean don't to buy, buy something right? You didn't mean to. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but no, I've, I mean, I've, I've done a fair bit of that over the last few months, right, where I've just, uh, you know, been involved just because I wanted to see what the experience was like. Interested. Yeah. And, and it's, it, you know, it's not one size fits all. There are some really good ones. There are some really bad ones. There are some where the platforms, frankly, stink. There are others which I think it's almost <laughs> as good as, uh, uh, as being there. But, you know, you've really got to. Do the work, I think, and as you say, go go, go well armed. Mm -hmm. Now, um, here's another question from a little earlier on that uh, Rose asked, and it's right up your alley. Do you have any tips for first home buyers? What funding or benefits are available for first home buyers who are not buying a new or substantially renovated property? Mm. <sighs> Nothing really. No, I, I, I jest <laughs> because it, it is something that I find very frustrating and that is that most of the incentive government incentives both federal and state are aimed at um, or are meant to encourage first home buyers to buy brand new or in some states they will allow substantially renovated but it has to be by a professional development company not just a mum and dad sort of flipper um, and, and and i think the thing that we've got to really understand and wrap our heads around as consumers is those incentives are not there to help first home buyers make good property decisions. They're not there to encourage first home buyers to, to get their foot on the right step of the ladder. What they're there for is to encourage and stimulate the construction industry. And they have been incredibly successful, the incentives have been incredibly successful at doing that because first home buyers are struggling to get into the established housing market. They see great benefits to themselves in the incentives if they go into you know, perhaps a house and land package or a brand new apartment in a large complex. Um, and, and these are not necessarily good property decisions, um, but it gives them an extra chunk of money if you like that actually gets them into the property market in their minds quicker than if they had to wait to save that money to buy a better quality asset so so one of the things about the incentives i, I think the only one that um that doesn't and we did a huge amount of analysis on this when we were researching home buyer academy uh, most of the incentives have a price cap so you can only spend up to a certain amount of money. And those price caps are different in the capital city versus the regional city. They're different in each state. Um, but the uh, super saver scheme, I think, is one of the few that doesn't actually um, force you or pigeonhole you into a brand new property. Um, now, that's not to say that is for everybody, but it is one of the few that will will, will not actually force you down that, that direction. So something to be really careful and really well researched before you decide to enter into that um, that scheme but definitely one to look at if you're looking to buy an established property yeah and just one other thing that occurs to me there's this 80 percent above or below right if you are putting in uh, less than 20 percent deposit then effectively LMI. you're going to be forced to pay the LMI premium, which gives you know quite a lot, even if it's capitalised. Um, although the government schemes allow you potentially to uh, go an alternative route in certain circumstances for certain types of property uh, and avoid LMI. And uh, there's a big debate going on at the moment as to whether LMI is actually a good thing or or not a good thing, right? Because it's sort of well, we can start. We can we can pick up that debate if you like Martin because um, I, I, I know that for a lot of people it is the, the idea is avoided at all costs but in a rapidly rising market there is a case for going and sitting down with a really good mortgage broker and understanding the difference between if you did have a little bit of LMI, like if you did pay a little bit of LMI, would you get into the market quicker and would the opportunity cost of being able to get into the market quicker into a good quality property, would that be better than waiting and having to pay the higher price in six months or 12 months? So I, I'm not sitting here saying that I think that everybody should look at 
paying LMI, I think there is a case for going and talking to a broker and understanding in your circumstances whether that is an option and what is the cost of that option and what is the opportunity cost if you wait until you've actually been able to save your full 20%. Yeah, I agree. Uh, there are definitely circumstances when LMI makes a lot of sense, right? Mm. Particularly um, if you find the property and you've, you know, you, you know that it's um, going to fit. And just remember this, of course, the LMI premium is not necessarily transferable, right? So you want to be sure you're going to be living in this place for a little while rather than just want to f turn it over in a year's time, right? Yeah. And there are also some rules about whether you can invest or, you know, or have to live in it and what have you. But nevertheless, um, there's a bunch of questions that you need, but the critical observation is lenders mortgage insurance does not protect the borrower, right? Yes, lenders mortgage good insurance point, well made. protects <laughs> the bank. It the basically lender. means that if in fact you default on the mortgage and for some reason, you know, there's, there's a deficit, uh, effectively the bank gets paid out. But this is the thing that people don't get, the lenders mortgage insurer, that insurer will come after the borrower <laughs> right? You still owe that money. So it doesn't wipe out the, the, the chunk of the money. And, you know, in my surveys, about one third of people still think that lenders mortgage insured protects them. It doesn't. It protects the bank. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and uh, you know, we're, we're, it's not America. You can't, if you can't afford your mortgage, you can't just hand the keys back. Uh, you, there are, you know, there are obligations that will survive your um, lack of willingness or ability to pay a mortgage. So the thing about lenders mortgage insurance, as you absolutely rightly point out, it protect, protects a bank. It doesn't protect you. you. You should be talking to a financial advisor about the things that you need to undertake or, or enter into to protect you, whether that's income protection, um, other life insurances and, and so forth. So there are things that as a property owner, you should also protect yourself with, but lenders mortgage insurance is not your protection it's the bank's protection yeah and i have to sell, tell you having waded through a few of these agreements right the contracts are pretty long-winded and difficult to understand right and uh, interestingly i had somebody the other day talking to me on a one-on-one -on -one who said even my solicitor didn't understand the contract oh. Oh, wow. <laughs> so the mortgage I, I, contract or the, the, the lenders mortgage insurance oh, sub clause really? of the contract right because basically it's an add-on to the the thing right um so, so it, it is worth you know saying to people um you know it's not a silver bullet by any means there are circumstances yeah. when it makes sense but it is worth um doing due diligence and, and really getting to understand it and remember folks it doesn't protect you it only protects the bank right and of course they've got an interest therefore in perhaps pushing and that's interestingly why more of the banks are doing their own lenders mortgage insurance now rather than actually outsourcing it to one of the two big third party um providers yeah. in australia and Martin, let's, let's not forget some institutions will um, do a higher LVR for certain professions. So this is where it's really important to actually seek the advice. We talk about building your support crew and, and it's really important to get the advice of people who know their their um, know their profession really well and can advise you in their lane and they stay in their lane. So I think the thing that's really hard for people, particularly first home buyers, is there is so much information coming at you from all different angles, mum and dad and the water cooler and colleagues and, you know, the guy that's bought his first unit in Randwick and, you know, like everybody's got an opinion. And it's, it's sometimes it's really hard to just shut out the noise and select some people who you trust and are experts in their field and who will stay in their lane and go and sit down with them and say, look, this is my situation. This is what I've heard. But can you tell me a little bit more about it? What, what are the pros? What are the cons? When would it be worth considering it? When should I really not do it? You know, this is what I do. This is what I earn. This is because all of this big picture about you uniquely, these are the things that are going to make you either an attractive or unattractive op opportunity for a financial institution. But there are so many differences and intricacies in lending policies and they're changing constantly. So just because mum and dad bought 15 years ago um, in outback Queensland, and they've had that one experience of buying the property back then, what their situation was and what their experience was and then what their memories were and what was happening back then is vastly different to 
you and your situation right now and what's happening now and the lending environment and the rules and the policies and the, all that's very, very different. So you need to get advice from the experts in their field, um, but don't ask anyone to be an expert outside their field. You know, a, a mortgage broker shouldn't tell you how much to pay for a property. And, and by God, look, I'm going to jump on the bandwagon here. Hold on for this one, Martin. Do not get auto valuations or property <laughs> reports that give you an estimate of what a property is worth. You've got to do that research yourself. That is, that is, you know, it's one of the things. There was a property. I'm going to talk about some properties shortly and give some very specific examples of what's happening in the market. But I just want to talk about one particular property. It just sold for just over 950000 and And today I went, I wonder what the property reports would say. So I Googled, you know, uh, free property report or property estimation or price estimation, whatever the case may be. So this place sold for just over 950. I don't know the exact figure because it's not unconditional. So the agent won't give it to me yet. Uh, the first two reports. So remember 950, first two reports, the indication was 750 to 800. Two reports said that. And a major bank gave an indication of 670 to 870. <laughs> You're not buying that house if you're getting free property reports and not doing your own research. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's, it's alarming. When I've done it in the past in uh, markets that weren't as fast moving, then they've overestimated because, because the prices aren't rising at the rate that the, the data and the algorithm, the way that they process the algorithms isn't, isn't giving them accurate data at the time. So, sorry, I, that, I just, that is one of my big bugbears. Do not do auto valuations. Don't rely on that information. Do your own independent research. No, it's great advice. And uh, yeah, no, 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 absolutely. Because it's one thing I've been saying a lot as well, you know, how all the, the property portals say, last asking price, you know, or that sort of stuff, right? People yeah. assume that means that that's the price it got sold at, right? Mm. And the fact is, it has not necessarily any relationship to what price was actually settled at. And you probably won't know for a number of weeks because, of course, the settlement processes have to run, right? And if you then actually go and get the real data, for example, in New South Wales, you can go to the uh, New South Wales database and you can pull out the settled value. Mm. And I've done that for quite a few properties. And almost always the settled value that the agreed price was actually quite a long way off what mm. the portals were suggesting it was either worth through their algorithms yep. or or yeah. even as indicated on the portal in terms of, you know, last asking price. So you've got to do that piece of work. Of all the things that, that you know, hopefully people will find useful today, that's probably one mm. of the most critical pieces of information, mm. right? Absolutely. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot take what was on the portal. And I know that people say, well, it's hedonic, isn't it? So it's fully adjusted for, you know, numbers of bedrooms and condition. And no, it's not. Come no, on. No, it's not. <laughs> it, it do well, actually... Number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, land size, you know, those sort of generic things. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Mm. That's, let's give it that. Mm. But, but what it doesn't take into account, we talked about this, you know, where on the hill is this property? Is it at the bottom of the hill or is it at the top of the hill? Does it have a south facing rear, a western facing rear, a north facing rear? Yes. These things actually impact price. You know, is it granite bench tops or Bunnings? Caboodle, um, these things impact price. Is the layout practical? Does it flow well? Are the room sizes good? Or is it a bit rabbit warrenty? You, you know, two single bedrooms and, and, and a large bedroom and no one can work out how to fit their children in the second and third bedroom. These things affect price. And these are the things that the algorithms can't take into account. Um, what is the outlook? Is it overlooked? Is the property next door going to be developed into a set of units? Is there a, a parking station nearby is there a petrol station with a 24-hour compressor going all the time these are things that affect price and the algorithms can't account for them they also can't account for you know improvements have they been done properly have they been approved like these things affect price and and it, it is only your own research and your own feet on the ground or getting someone in who has their feet on the ground and who, who who can actually help you with this stuff it's only actually doing that and understanding that yourself that you can take a sale price when you get the sale price and go oh yeah i went through that property had a back to front layout the deck was you know it, it overlooked the school and you know, could hear the bell ringing every other day and um yep i can understand why that sold for that one whereas that one went for two hundred thousand dollars more and yeah it had a really nice outlook and it was elevated and there was no way that you could your view could be built up these things affect price and you only actually know these things when your feet are on the ground and you're seeing those those aspects of those properties that make them comparable or not comparable. Absolutely. And that's the point, isn't it? Com 
com comparable means, you need to have significant understanding of the X's and the Y's and all the bits and pieces, right? So you can actually make a you know a like for like comparison. And unfortunately, yeah. apples and pears and apples and apples are not the same. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Throwing a banana. I mean, honestly, um, you know, some of the properties that we see in these property reports, Veronica and I did uh, our very first course that we created for Home Buyer Academy. We did a free pricing, how to price a property course. So you can download it free, do it free. Um, and we actually pulled apart some of these reports and, and, and then said, all right, well, what you can use, the first thing you need to do is take a big black marker and cross out the price estimate. What you can do is use the sales data from the reports because they'll often give you the actual sale price and some of the features of the properties. And if you've if you've been doing your research, feet on the ground and, and you've been checking these things in the areas that you're interested in, then you'll be starting to develop a bit of an idea. You've been through a few properties, what's good, what's bad, that sort of stuff, and building a knowledge base. So you can actually, the thing that you can use off those property reports is the actual sales data from the individual properties. You've then got to use some analysis and we, we provide tools and a bit of a guidance on how to do the analysis for the comparable parts of the properties where they are inferior, superior and so forth um, to actually say, all right, well, it's superior in these aspects, inferior in those aspects, it sits roughly in this range um, and you start to develop an understanding of actually how to make those comparisons. And, and that really is the basis of comparable sales methodology, which is what, what real estate agents and, and buyers agents use. You're not going to be an expert in six months, but at least you'll know what to discount and you say, no, that's not comparable um, and, and how to analyse the data and actually start forming really good um, opinions about what something's worth mm. rather than throwing a dart you know don't throw yeah, a dart i was going to say just uh, have a cute you know throw, you might as well guess um we'll come on in a, in a second or two to talk about median prices and how, how they can be useful or how they can also not be useful when it comes to decision mm. but i just wanted to pick up a other couple of questions first this is one that jason asked earlier on and jason thank you very much for the super chat um does megan expect a small pack or short-lived spike once queensland relaxes its border controls which prevents Victoria and Sydney from getting in there with under tiny prices or an overall growth long term, perhaps. And he also went on to say, disclosure in Queensland is rubbish, in my humble opinion. <laughs> this, I think it's true. I could not agree more, Jason. Uh, disclosure, lack of disclosure in Queensland is rubbish. Uh, but we digress. Look, honestly, Martin, and, and I don't pull in punches, you, you'll always get what I think, but I could not have anticipated what the market is doing at the moment. This this human behaviour that we're seeing, um, this change in the way that people are looking at their lifestyles and 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 the way that people are so fearful of missing out on what is a rapidly running market. Um, I couldn't have picked that 12 months ago. At yep. this point in September last year, we were just starting to see the seeds. No, it was actually August. We we're just starting to see the seeds of people coming out of lockdown and saying, oh, okay, we're, we're, we're still employed. We're okay. The world is continuing. Oh, I've just spent three or four months in a house that I don't really like anymore. Uh, I think I'll go and get another one. So this this strange kind of almost euphoric behaviour of quick, let's go and get a better house in a better place and next time there's a lockdown, if there is one, we'll be so much happier because we'll have a pool and a big rumpus room and we won't be on top of each other for homeschooling. Um, it, it just, it's, it's, it's almost counterintuitive. I keep saying to people, I just shake my head sometimes that, at the way that this is happening, but it is. So we have to deal with it. We have to say, all right, well, how do we manage um, ourselves in, in this as buyers and as sellers and agents and buyers agents and, and valuers. I mean, I, you know, must be a tough gig being a valuer at the moment, honestly, because uh, they are very, they have to rely on data and facts and, and settled sales at the moment in Brisbane, settled sales are outdated once they've settled and settlements usually four weeks. <laughs> so you can't even rely on the data from the sales from four weeks ago to give you an indication of what you should pay for a property or what a property is worth now, because people are just simply going, I missed out on that one. I'm just going to load up another 10% on that one. Um, so is that going to continue? I think as long as we haven't got any of that, uh, you know, there's, there's a number of things, right? So interest rates, interest rates are low at the moment. Um, but assessment criteria is still a little bit unreasonable. You know, there's that, uh, the fact that banks are looking line by line and they are forced to do that by the legislation rather than having a general assessment criteria. 
Um, tightening credit has had a big impact on investment. So I'm going to talk a little bit later about what I see is, is the biggest thing that we need to wrap our heads around, and that is the decreasing number of rental properties that are available for people. As long as expats are continuing to come home, when we're seeing that that influx of people, and as long as that interstate migration continues, then we're going to going to see that that inward pressure. We're just where a Queensland is going to go. There still aren't opportunities to work overseas. People aren't moving to Sydney and Melbourne. There's no need to. They can get those jobs here remotely and, and work from Queensland. So there's nothing that we can see in in the horizon that doesn't continue to place upward pressure on prices. Um, there's a there's some data I'm going to talk about later, which is actually sales volumes and what sales volumes have been doing um, in Queensland. There's a lot of talk about there being not enough listings or a shortage of stock. Um, and, I, and I actually don't think that's the case. I, I actually think there is as much stock as there has been in any other year. There is just far more buyers than there are properties available to buy. Um, so if that if that continues, that inequity between the number of people, so the, the increase in population and the, the, the number of people moving here and not leaving, um, if that continues while supply doesn't increase, then yet we're going to continue to see this upward pressure on prices. And after the borders open and, and people can physically come here themselves, then that's going to place even more pressure on the rental market, which is already under in, in incredible pressure in, in Queensland. Mm. And it's worth saying that uh, if you make um, comparisons between the purchase price of a property in Sydney and Melbourne versus Queensland, right, and Brisbane, right, it's so much cheaper. You get so much more property, oh, right? And, and so, you know, people who've been used to Sydney and Melbourne prices look at mm. Brisbane prices and think, gee, that's amazing. So that process is going to continue. So my own read is that, um, you know, we're not necessarily going to see Brisbane prices fall out of bed over the next little while in mm. fact probably if anything for the reasons that you've articulated there's going to be continued momentum particularly for houses i think there's the units different oh, story can we just what... really be really clear i'm yep. talking houses yep. when i talk about Good. this market we're yep. going to separate and have a very short discussion about <laughs> units but i'm talking or this is houses that i'm talking about yep. not, not yep. apart from actually the, the thing i will put in the same category is large um almost house size apartments so yep. pres prestige apartments you know your large three four bedrooms your two three car garage you know maybe 300 square meters 400 square meters um they sit in the same category as houses in, mm. in brisbane in those locations where there's lifestyle aspects river city view so forth Right, but not the rabbit hutches on the in the high rise sector, which not of the which the, gutters. no, 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 which of which there are many in in, yeah, in many different yeah. areas. Now, let me just answer this one other question, and then I want to come on to um, talk specifically I don't know about. If I answered that question for her fully. Did we cover off each of those things? For the oh, first I, think we, I mean, there's, I think, there's I think so we, much. I could I go think, on and on. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, the next thing is to say there's a course, isn't there? So they should go and get the course. Well, right? arm yourself with information. I think <laughs> yeah. that's the biggest thing, yeah, and and, and that's property across the board and yeah. and information is not something that you get from somebody who is selling you something else <laughs> so someone who's selling you something else and telling you that you should be doing something is called a spruker mm. um, and we want to be really really clear with people and particularly first home buyers you know i can't i can you know it makes me sick to the stomach when i see you know i saw an ad pop into you know i was watching one of your replays <laughs> show the other night and i was you know i, I did this <gasps> Right in the middle of it came this ad. Do you want to make this much money doing this? And, you know, this is wonderful and you can make, you know, so much money and so forth. And I, 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 I was doing this going, oh, my God, if Martin knew that this was cutting into his broadcast, you'd have a fit. But I guess I think that I can't stress enough that for every success from these sorts of things, someone who might have made money, doing you know particular types of strategies that are high risk or whatever for every success there's going to be 99 other people who either lost money or just managed to get out what they put in and that's not success you know you don't yep. you don't use this much money and leverage to to walk away with with a loss or you know so you can lose money in in property i think the other thing to remember is anyone that says they're giving you advice 
or helping you into a property, if they're being paid by anybody else, whether that's a real estate agent, whether it's a developer who's paying somebody to market the property, um, whatever the case may be, if they're being paid by somebody else, they're not helping you. They can be nice to you, they can be helpful, but they're not the one helping you or should, or nor should they be advising you. You should be stepping away and getting independent advice before you make any decisions, particularly if someone's trying to pigeonhole you into something that doesn't look or feel right. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. A lot of people have motivations which aren't completely transparent. And uh, as you say, sometimes money talks, unfortunately. I just want to answer Aaron's question from earlier on. Can LMI be reimbursed if the property is revaluated to exceed the LVR? Don't think it can. And uh, almost, almost certainly, unless you ask in a particular way, you can't even transfer the lender's mortgage insurance from one property to another property, right? So it's pretty much a sunk cost the day you take it out. Yeah, not my area of expertise, and as you know, I stick to my lane. Um, so that would be you know, a question for a mortgage broker, or you know, my understanding is once you've paid it, it's gone. Yep, that's pretty and much the property pretty specific. much it. That there, there are exceptional circumstances where, if you really ask in a particular way, they might sometimes give you some of it back, right? But it's not standard; it's not disclosed, and most people never ask. So, and of course, they don't want to publicise it because they don't want to have to pay back those premiums because they make a lot of, a lot of uh, <laughs> money from those premiums. Now, let's talk about Wavell Heights because I asked you, what is the best suburb to look at to try and understand what's really, really going on in you know, Brisbane mm -hmm. property at the moment? And this is the one you picked. So mm -hmm. we've got a bit of information to share and, and, and you know, talk, talk, talk us through it. Um, where do you want to start that particular part of the conversation? Uh, look, I, I think the thing, you know, we've talked about what's what, the pressure that's that's coming into the market from the demand side of things. We've talked talked about easy access to credit, um, low interest rates, you know, the, the fact that there's more buyers than sellers. Um, all of these things are, are, are largely what's driving um, the demand, the supply and the demand side of things. But what, what people are, are struggling to get their head around is, you know, tell me realistically, I could have bought this property last year for 700, 685,000 and you're telling me now, so when we advise clients, we, we talk to them about data and sales and what's happening and so forth. And then in this market, we actually have to overlay. Now, all that data tells us this price, but you might have to stretch yourself to this price to actually buy it. You know, it almost sounds counterintuitive for a buyer's agent to be saying, you need to be, pay you need to be paying more than we say it's worth. Um, but that unfortunately is exactly the market that we're in at the moment. And, and the example that I wanted to use was a particular street in Wavell Heights. And if you can just bring up the first slide, there's a bit of data here, but if you, if you stay with me, it'll make sense. Hopefully people can read that. If not, blow your screen up or put your glasses on. Um, <laughs> you might be able to see it better. So this particular street in Wavell Heights, it's just a residential street. It's actually quite flat, so there's not a lot of... Um, topography or, or differences at all to deal with. Every one of these houses that, that has sold between January 17, I used that as a baseline, whilst it's very pre-COVID, I just wanted to show a bit of a, a pre-COVID kind of pattern before we show a, a post-COVID pattern. So every house that's sold in this street is uh, has an eastern facing frontage, which means it has a western facing rear. Now in Queensland, that's your less desirable of all of the orientations of your rear, which is usually your entertaining area um, when you when you have a house. So when you renovate a house and and you know have your lovely living room flowing out to your entertaining area, the ideal is a north facing rear. It, it gets lovely sun in. The winter and it avoids the sun heavy sun in the summer so all of these houses are on the same side of the street they have a western facing rear and in a stroke of luck they are all very comparable so they're three bedroom post-war houses that means something i'll get to it in a moment um, that have been unrenovated so and very similar size blocks so you'll start to see if you're running your eye over over this table at the moment, you're going to start to see a pretty strong pattern very quickly. So pre-COVID, that was the, I just chose that January 17 
sale as a baseline, 595 on 610 square metres, site value of 480,000. So I'm going to quickly talk about site value and then I might talk about it again. Site value is the, the valuation, I guess, that um, the, the value of general assigns to the land. It is not the value of the property. So it's really what's used to, for rates um, and land tax. So that, that's the rateable value, if you like. They're all pretty similar. So we, we're dealing with similar size blocks of land, similar site values or rateable values, and on the same side of the street with the same orientation. Now, uh, if you just flick quickly to the next slide. Just turn that out. There we go. Yeah, flick quickly. Okay, so this is just, this is what they are. These are post-war houses. Now, post-war is a really important one in Queensland, particularly in Brisbane, in the local government area. If a house was built before 1946 and it is on particularly or as a particular zoning and has a certain overlay, a character overlay, if it's built before 1946, then in most cases it cannot be removed or demolished. Houses that were built after 1946, there's an aerial photo, anyone can access it on Brisbane City Plan 2014. Um, there's an overlay with an aerial photo and if the structure is in that photo or it can be shown that the house was built in 1946, um, then can't be demolished or removed if it's in a um, certain zoning and, and has character overlay. But if it's post-war, you can, you can knock it down. So the phenomenon that we've started to see is a rush on these post-war houses and you can see how quickly it started going. So the post-war houses, you know, they're, they're very simply simple. Most of these houses have the original kitchen, the original bathroom. They have a lot of asbestos lining internally because it was that era when asbestos was heavily used and either, you know, either an asbestos roof or a tile roof or in some cases an iron roof. So they're all really similar and that, that's actually pictures of some of the houses that have sold in that table. So let's just flip back to the table, Martin, um, and have a look. So the first sale was five ninety five in January 17. Sorry, just Next, so you want, do you want the first table back or the, the other yeah, table? first one, please. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Uh, so the first one, as I say, 595, little bit of growth then um, to 610,000 in April 17. Now at that point, the median house price in at the end of 2017 was 680,000. Um, so yeah, it was sort of in line with slightly above the Brisbane median at the time. Next sale of number eight was in January 18. We're starting to get a little bit of growth there, 640,000. Now that was 15 months after the previous sale, only 5%. So not a strong period of growth in Brisbane. Fast forward to October 20, and this is where things get really interesting. Remember, I've chosen this street because these are the most comparable houses in the same street with a number of sales that show the actual progression of, of, of buyer behaviour. So October 20, let's call that really, you know, people starting to come out of the darkness and, and start to get active, sales starting to happen. The sale of number 24 in this street at 685,000, um, let's, let's say post COVID, you know, or, you know mid COVID kind of starting point, January 21, the next two houses up, uh, number 28 sold for 761,000. So that was 11% growth in only three months. So that was the first sign that we were, you know, really starting to see some, some upward activity in the median house price in Brisbane then was 770,000 at the end of 2020. Fast forward to April 21, the next sale was 830,000. So we're looking at 9% growth over the previous sale. May 21, 865,000. So another 4% in only one month, directly comparable houses. And then the most recent sale, which is only under contract, I haven't got the actual sale price, the agent has indicated it's over 950,000 um, and that's 10% in just four months. So there, that's a really short time span that we're looking at between January 21 and September 21 um where the growth you know you, you blink and a month later you're, you're paying an extra 50 what's that 70 80 thousand dollars you can't earn that in a year uh, sorry can't uh, earn that in a month can you <laughs> can you imagine as a buyer how hard it would have been 
to be the person who fronted up for the October 20 auction, yep. missed out, and then the next one came up in January 21. Oh, geez, I wasn't expecting that. Like, do you know what I mean? Like it's how do you as a buyer reconcile? Now, these are knockdown houses. Let, yep. let, and this is the phenomenon that we're seeing is that um, people are now looking at knockdown houses, which are hard to get in Brisbane in the, the, the inner city area. So this is Wavell Heights is 8 to 10 kilometres from the CBD. It's quite a large suburb, very low density suburb, lots of character houses. But these post-war houses have skyrocketed in popularity because you can knock them down, build a Hamptons or, you know, Queensland style, um, really customise it to, to your own needs. But we're now seeing that properties over 600, uh, 600 square metres in this particular suburb in slightly better positions. Every suburb has, you know, different gradings in positions. In slightly better positions, over $1.2 million uh, was a sale of a 770 square metre block of, oh, well, it had a house on it, it's going to get knocked down, um, which just blew over and out of the water. That, that shouldn't have been any more than maybe a million and fifty, realistically, when you look at the data. Uh, so that that's what Brisbane is doing at the moment, and mm. it's probably the realist. Um, we can look at median house prices. We can look at price changes. You know, we can analyse the data. There's the sales of directly, you know, really comparable houses in a street over a, a short period of time. Um, oh. and, and honestly, in, in our office, we just shake our heads at the moment. <laughs> What are people doing? And there's just a couple of other perspectives. This is actually the one that you uh, showed, which was the zoning, right? Very low yeah. density, right? Uh, really low density. There are other suburbs quite close by mm. where the density rates going through the roof. And as a result of that, you know, blocks are being sold and then basically subdivided. And then we're, I'm seeing that in Sydney and Melbourne too, right? Yeah, and suddenly the yeah. character of the place changes, the density changes, and the value occasion is completely different. Right. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. And the neighbouring suburb is is it was rezoned, uh, I th think, as part of the current city plan. So around I was pre two thousand and fourteen, but it was rezoned to be a transit, what was considered a transit oriented development at the time, uh, which may actually be an older than two thousand and fourteen. But it's a it's also a commercial hub. Um, so the idea was to rezone a lot of the blocks around there, largely post-war, not a lot of character in the, the neighbouring suburb, it's actually mostly post-war, it was, was developed more in the 50s and 60s, uh, the neighbouring suburb, but has the big Westfield, Westfield shopping centre there. So um, in order to encourage use of public transport, a lot of uh, the sites around these these transit oriented developments were rezoned to encourage people to live in higher density so stacked living units so forth um, and use public transport to get into the city so they're trying to stack around the transport hubs which are great in theory um, what's missed the mark in brisbane is that People want to live in houses. They don't want to live yep. in apartments necessarily. Uh, and so those, those are, the, the, the demand for those apartments from owner occupiers has not been strong. And and we'll talk about growth of, of units versus houses. But, you know, that, that's a, a vastly different story when you talk about that suburban growth in, in units. Mm. Um, houses have done well because they're development sites. So they're going to get a premium for highest and best use. Absolutely. Well, that's the other point I make that often if you're in those sorts of suburbs where there is subdivision possible, then you're competing with builders who can mm. basically buy the place, knock it down and build three or six or whatever on it, right? And yep. that puts a, a floor under the price. Um, I will just share this information. This, so this is my um, analysis of um, houses first. And you can see there that to basically the average going over the last 10 years about 6.3. But look at that massive peak in the last year mm -hmm. or so, which is what you're, what you're seeing. And if I compare that with units, right? Units, well, not really doing much. Now, I know there aren't that many units in the area. Not a but lot the, of units, but, yeah. But, but there is a fundamentally different set of behaviours for units versus houses, right, uh, mm. as we said earlier on. And I think it's just worth underscoring again that, um, you know, the ABS data came out today and that showed that prices were up strongly over the last um, quarter up till June. But it was houses, not units, yeah. where, where yeah. the action is, right? And so we've got this sort of disjointed market where you've got, um, you know, a lot of houses, particularly... Uh, those that perhaps are in more attractive areas and perhaps slightly more expensive, but a lot mm. of the units are still dropping in the number of areas. And even now in areas of Queensland, they're still going backwards. 
Yeah, just despite this um, this movement of people in and and the um, reluctance of people to, to leave, um, you know, unit prices. We've got a we've got a number of um, home buying principles in Home Buyer Academy, and, and one of them is if it's easy to buy, it's going to be hard to sell, and it's never more true than in in a in a seller's market where um, if it is easy to buy, and, and apartments at the moment are. And we're talking two bed, two bath, investor stock, sort of cookie cutter, small, um, stacked on top of each other. Not, you know, they're the sorts of things we're talking about. We're not talking about the the, the really high end luxury, um, well put together, almost mini house type type scenarios. Um, but they're people look in Brisbane look at those and say, well, if I can get a house with some land under my feet, then I'd actually rather do that than be a little bit closer to, you know, Westfield Chermside um, and, and, and be in apartments. So the, the lifestyle decision of people is still directed towards um, the house, the freehold house, or even maybe a townhouse, which is um, a, a good alternative, sort of sits between the two. Um, but, but the thing I guess I, I really want to um, go back to is, if it's easy to buy, which units are, even in this very difficult, high pressure market, if it's easy to buy, it's going to be hard to sell, particularly when the demand isn't as strong. And there's lots of others that are just like yours that are all for sale at the same time. And one of the things that I have a, a huge fear of with these incentives that are, are encouraging first home buyers to buy brand new is, who are you going to sell it to? Mm. Because if, if, if first home buyers are incentivized to buy new, then who, who, who is actually going to pick up this second hand unit when it comes time for you to upgrade? And, and they're, they're, you know, in, in many, many cases, as your life stage changes, you, you might move, you might start in a two bedroom unit and then you might move into um, a small house and, and so forth. And, and if you can't get out of that unit at least what you paid for it, you would hope that you do better than getting out of it what you paid for it. But unfortunately, um, and I don't have the data here, but I have done analysis on a number of buildings where resales have dropped significantly. So what someone has paid, and, and just one example, um, in another transit-oriented development, not Termside, but a different suburb, where there's lots and lots and lots of these two-bedroom apartments. Someone paid 560 off the plan. Its bank valuation now is 430. Now that they can't sell that, but they've had to keep topping up to keep at the 80% uh, LVR. So they're actually putting more and more money in to just keep afloat, hoping that this apartment will recover in some way. Now you can probably understand that I've been recommending a, a, a divestment on that, that asset for a while, um, but, but it's, it's, it's a terrible place to put yourself in if you've used incentives to get into something new. And then we, we've had a number of students in Home Buyer Academy who have told us they're not first home buyers, but the first property they bought was a house and land package. It went backwards, they lost money. Now they're trying to in, engage in arming themselves with the right information so they make good decisions and they aren't, you know, take the blinkers off. Don't don't just look for the incentives. Actually look at what is the right property for you to live in and, and, and you know, you and I probably will debate forever whether a home also should have investment characteristics as well or should it be just, you know, about your home and, and you know, we have a very big belief that capital growth is important regardless of whether it's a home or, or an investment property and fundamentals are important um, and buying A-grade property versus C-grade property, it's important. Um, these are all things that, that enable people to ride out the waves of property markets that will cycle up and down. Um, and if the bank comes knocking on your door and says, look, we think your property is worth, worth less than it was last time we valued it, you've got to either have the cash to top up to, to keep at the right level of LVR, uh, right um, loan to value ratio, or find something else that can be used as an asset to, to support it. And then you're starting to cross collateralize and, you know, it starts to get really, really messy. So capital growth actually is important, even if it's, if it's your home. Mm. Well, um, I, you may have picked up from one of my earlier shows where I said, look, it seems to me that there are some fundamental differences from investing in property and seeing property as effectively an asset class like any other, right? Versus mm. 
a place where you are buying because it's going to you're going to put down roots and it's going to be where you want to be for the 5 10 15 20 years right yeah all i'm saying is it's a bit like a seesaw right some of it's more important some of it's less important yes the fact totally is like compromises yeah, yeah you, you got to sort of level it up right but what you can't do is to assume that if you're going to buy that place that you want to live in it's automatically going to be the best investment that you can get as well that's the problem yeah right yep. you're going to have to compromise and that's really all i'm saying and and what, what i often say to people is it's really important to think it through why are you buying what are you really trying to get out of it first question second question is do you understand all of the financial aspects so what are the transaction costs getting in and of course if you sell what are the transaction costs for getting out because people forget those there right yep. and the third is um play devil's advocate with your own finances what happens if you know what happens if you know, incomes get compressed or another virus appears, you know, how are you going to fare? Because you can't just assume that it's going to be perfect, right? You've got to assume that it might actually not quite go according to plan. And those are some of the things that I think can make the difference between making a really good decision and making a bad decision. It's good risk management, isn't it? And it's something that I think that, that we're not necessarily taught through school and, and so forth. And that is... Um, it's it's good to to you know um, be robust in your decision making and and move forward and be ambitious and so forth, but if you do it in a way that manages your risks and that is what's the worst case scenario if I do this and I lose my job, what happens or is there something that I can do to help myself if that situation what if I get married what if we have children and we go down to one income they, these yeah. are all good risk management questions and and having discussions with the right people at the right time whether that be a broker a finance advisor um, these are all good things to kind of nut out scenarios of okay well if this happens and you know what good risk management if you have thought through the worst case scenario you get comfortable with it but you don't let yourself get into analysis paralysis mode because you don't want to not make a decision because mm. there's risks in everything. Yep. Um, so you don't want to get into analysis paralysis mode. But if you if you uh, if you know well, what if this happens? Okay. Well, I know what I need to do if that happens, yep. and I can deal with that. I'm comfortable to move forward. Then you're actually in a position of power within yourself to be able to feel really comfortable and comfort confident that. All right, well, I know what the worst case scenario is. I've got it. I'm, I'm fine with it. Yep. Um, it'll be tough and it'll be hard, but we know how we're going to handle it. Yeah, and it's one other, one other thing. A lot of people still assume that if the bank says, sure, we'll give you the money, <laughs> right, the bank has then, they think, done the due diligence on them and that means that they can definitely afford it. Afford it. <laughs> and pay it back. And, and I keep reminding people that banks are only about the risk of loss to them. Yep. They're not about your finances and the way that you manage your affairs, right? And yet the number of times I've heard people say, but the bank said, <laughs> no, <laughs> you've got to understand what the bank's at, right? So it's very yeah, important yeah. again. They to want do... you to borrow as much money as they can lend you. For as Look, long as possible. There is responsible lending. You know, there, there is the Royal Commission to bring in a lot of good things, <laughs> a lot of tough things as well. Um, but, you know, that's a whole other show. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I, I also, you know, I've been quoted and I still stand by the quote that I'm, I'm of the belief that not everyone can or should own property. And I know yep. that's I know that's kind of it's not yeah, you know, it's not popular and I get it. It's not a human right to own property. And some people think it's un Australian if you don't. But the basic human need is to have adequate shelter and safety. And for many many people that you know, it comes in the form of a rental property, not ownership of a property. Um, and you know, it, this is this is something that I'm like I'm really quite concerned about in Queensland, and that is I, I think actually Australia-wide, and that is the absence of investors buying oh. property to replenish the properties that have been sold by investors who are taking advantage of high prices, good growth, you know, great opportunity to to um, to divest, and you know, what are they going to do with their money? I'm not really sure because. I, where else would you have it to have the kind of stock market at the crypto Crypt <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> look i'm learning a lot about crypto i i i, I have to admit i i'm not dipping my toe in myself but i'm sitting on the sidelines watching yeah, uh, yeah someone else a good place who, to be yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
still going, what? I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> Give me property. I, I can mm. understand it. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Do, do you know what I mean by that? I, I think that um, there are just some people who, you know, just shouldn't own a property and, and won't ever in their life. Um, and that's okay, but we have to make sure that there is enough in the rental pool that they're not squeezed out of um, what is reasonable housing standards on an ongoing basis for people who are renting properties. And, and um, mm. yeah, I know there's been some changes in other states and there's going to be some changes and proposed changes in Queensland too. Mm. Absolutely. Now, there was a question that came up earlier on from Mrs Henderson. Thank you very much for the super chat. As a first-time buyer in Brisbane, Am I going to have better luck finding a quality house via an auction or offers or off market? Love your podcast, Megan. Thank you, Mrs. Henderson. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so uh, firstly, congratulations. If you've got to the point of being a first time buyer in Brisbane, you've obviously done a lot of work to get to that point. Um, can I say that there's no luck in finding a quality house um, and how it is for sale does not affect the quality of the house. So what I mean by that is there are two primary methods of sale of properties in Australia. There are other methods, but the two primary methods are public auction or private treaty or private sale. Um, and I'm not talking about private sellers, so people selling their own property. Let's just put, for now put it in the realm of, of being listed with a real estate agent just, just for the discussion. Um, so. The, if, if it's a public auction, it is simply a different process and you do things in a different order to a property that is offered for sale by private treaty. So you're not going to get a better quality property out of either process. You're just going to have to do the process differently and in a different order. You still need to do all the same high levels and intense due diligence that you would have to do for either of those things. It's just that with an auction, you do the due diligence before the auction, before you know whether you've bought it. Whereas private treaty in most states, except for New South Wales, you can make conditional offers, which is an offer on a contract to an owner who may accept that. Um, and then you might have a conditional period where you can get finance approved and building pest inspections done and conveyancing searches and any other sort of due diligence that you need to do. So the quality of the property is vastly different to the method of sale. I would not, I would not discourage you from, um, no, I would not discourage you. I would encourage you to push away any thoughts about whether you should buy at auction or private tree. Buy the best property that suits you is within your budget and has the right set of compromises for you. Doesn't matter if it's going to auction or by private treaty. So the method of sale doesn't influence whether you should buy it or not. And it doesn't influence, it's not a, a reflection of whether the property is quality or not. Hope that long winded answer <laughs> was clear enough. Um, mm. You know, just arm yourself with the information about how to bid at an auction, what to do in the process, you know, what in, in the different ways in, 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 in the different states. Know what it is that you need to do in your state. There's cooling off periods in some states. There's not cooling off periods in other states. Um, what does that mean? Well, you, you, whether you can get out of a contract that's formed or not. With auctions, no cooling off period. So you bid, your highest bidder, past reserve, you buy. So it's really important just to understand the different methods of sale um, because when the right property comes up, it doesn't matter how you buy it as long as you have done your research properly and, and it's the right property and you pay. Look, you're not going to get a bargain in this market, let's be honest, um, but as long as you're not paying an extraordinary amount of money or just throwing a dart or throwing every cent that you've got at the property regardless of what it's worth. Um, Martin, the other part of that question was... No, I think covered off the main points which was the okay. three routes um and the other part was she liked your she liked your podcast oh thanks i just wanted to say that again no. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so that that's it we have veronica and i have an awful lot of fun doing that podcast so it's um <laughs> It's uh, it's weekly. We release it on a Wednesday. We we do a YouTube um, video for it as well. It's an absolute hoot. Um, you can see my background here is quite colourful. Every time we do the podcast, I put a different crazy house as my backdrop, and you know I've had you know the toilet house in Korea, and I've had the um, steel house in 
Texas, I think it was, and the skateboard house in Malibu. Like there are some fantastic houses that, that we can look at. But the podcast is really about um, pulling away some of the layers or some of the misconceptions that people have about property, um, how to buy, you know, g- giving people real, honest truthful and sometimes brutal information that makes them stop and think wow I don't know what I don't know but I'm starting to learn and and that's really what the podcast is about is is giving people free access to expert advice that they can rely on more power to your elbow I mean I'm very fortunate that I've been able to bring a few different people on from various aspects you know I, I had a, a strata lawyer on a few weeks ago um obviously yourself and um yeah. Uh, I, I've had Veronica on and others too, because I think we're all passionate about one thing, which is helping people to get better informed, to make yeah. better decisions, right? Not just to get rolled over by the spruikers, not just to get sucked mm. into something which um, you then live to regret. Because actually, if you do the do the work on the way in, it's going to pay dividends down the track. Yeah, that's you know I, pr- pretty important. I, I think hand on heart, what I really like. What, what I really dislike is hearing people say, I wish I'd known, blah, 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 blah. And I think that's, 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 that's the passion part of it is, you know, to be, I don't believe, you know, I'm not a big fan of the word property expert. I, I think an expert is simply a collection of experiences. Mm. And when you put a couple of people together who have had a vast, a vast collection of experiences, we bought over, Veronica and I have bought over, oh, one point to one point three billion dollars worth of properties. You know, we, we've we've worked with over fifteen hundred, sixteen hundred clients. Um, it's a lot of property to buy, and it's a lot of things to see. Um, and I guess what we've picked up is we know who to ask if we don't know the answer. And that's the big thing that we want to teach people is well, what are the questions that you need to ask, and who do you need to go to to find the answers, so that you are actually arming yourself with all the right information. You're managing your risks really well, and you're not ending up at the end of the day with a property where you say, "I wish I'd known this." Yep. Wise after the event is not a good place to be. No. Um, well, we're coming up very close to our, our nine thirty cutoff, but there was a couple of quick questions oh which my just wanted God, to. Martin, where did that go? <laughs> I have no idea, but obviously uh, we're both enjoying the conversation. Hopefully, the audience, I think they are too. Um, one, uh, two people asked about: Have you seen locals being priced out of the market? And the other side of that is: We know that some people are financially stressed at the moment, partly because of COVID and partly because of the things. Are you seeing that um, in the in the local market there as well? Well, it's interesting. Um, we we are we're still working for a, a high number, a high percentage of local upgraders, and and one of the primary reasons that they come to us is they do fear being priced out of the market, um, and 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 I think that's you know a, a rather legitimate fear at the moment. What what they ne- what um, local upgraders, local home buyers, local first buyers need first um, home buyers need to do is to keep a level head but not delay decision making um the, the, i think the thing that really frustrates a lot of people is when they say i wish i'd bought when we first started talking about it 12 months ago well you know you can't go backwards you can only start from now and you can only arm yourself with good information good, make good decisions but you need to move quickly um i had a really good quote from kate bakos who is a buyer's agent in melbourne she's actually the president of rebo which is the the buyer's agents association of australia and and she said this is not the market to be looking for a needle in a haystack and and what she meant by that was you always have to make compromises, but some people are waiting and waiting and waiting for the, for the perfect property. Um, and they wait and wait and wait until they price themselves out of the market. So I, I think the thing to be is very realistic in your expectations. Understand your compromises in the three key areas. And we, we talk about the three key areas being key areas being price, property and position. Understand your compromises in those things be armed and ready to move very quickly when you find a property who, that meets um, the right compromises for you and be prepared to push yourself for quality properties. And if local buyers are doing that, then they're, they're just as, as um, on equal footing as interstate or expat buyers. Um, they have the advantage, though, I think, of being able to move somewhat quicker and with somewhat more information and, and some you know a lot more surety because they can get the on the ground um 
uh, knowledge and, and experience of actually going through a lot of properties. So they're actually seeing how quickly things are moving. And it only takes missing out on a couple of properties to realise that, you know, you really need to think very differently in this market to any other market that we've ever had in the past. Yeah, certainly interesting times. Um, Julia said, um, love Megan, best places to buy investments in Queensland at the moment? Uh, impossible question, probably, because it depends on what you're looking, where you're looking, right? Yeah, thank you for answering that, Martin. I'll say no more. No, so <laughs> <laughs> it's the first question, one of the very first questions we get we'll get asked, where should I buy? And the, the thing is that, that the answer to that question is unique to each individual person. Now, that's not to say that there aren't a lot of areas where I would recommend against buying, and there are a number, area, number of areas that are actually on our um, investment matrix, which is um, a set of suburbs that have met certain criteria and certain, you know, certain property types and certain price ranges. So a lot of research has gone into that, but that's Brisbane local government area only. There's a lot of other areas that are probably good investing as well. Mm. But the answer to the question whether you're an investor or an owner occupier is a product of an analysis of those three things that I just mentioned, position, property and price. But those things can only come after you've done a lot of work working out why you're buying the property, where are you in your life cycle, what are you expecting it to achieve, how realistic is that? Um, all of these things need to be taken into account before you even start thinking about where to buy. Because if you start, if you, you know, if I said to you a really great suburb to buy in is Ashgrove, great growth, high, um, lots of owner occupiers, big box of land, big houses, lots of renovation, high income, good schools, you know, all those sorts of things. I happen to live there myself, um, so maybe a little bit biased. But you know, if you have a budget of six hundred thousand you're not going to buy in Ashgrove. So it doesn't matter that that's a good suburb to invest in or to, to raise your family in. It's not, it's not, it's no good even, even you know, putting that into the equation. So you've got to know those other things and have, have done a lot of upfront work before you can even start thinking about where to buy. Absolutely. It's almost the um, end of the story rather than the beginning of the story, funnily enough, because of all those other steps you have to take first, right? Yeah, look, it's it's well, it is it is part of the preparation phase. So mm. in the PACE system, we have ten steps, and it is part of the preparation phase. But it's after you've actually done a lot of naval gazing and talking to the experts, um, the financial advisor, the mortgage broker, understanding your situation, understanding your goals, um, how long you're going to hold the property for, and you know, I, I, you know, there's no one that I know who knows anything about property who would say anything less than ten years as, as an investor, and and you're speculating. Um, as a home buyer, you might have a stepping stone strategy, but you've got to make some really, really, really good decisions about which property you buy if you're going to step up into your dream home eventually. Um, but, it, but it is, it is part of the preparation phase. Before you actually start pounding the pavement and doing your online research, you have to understand yourself and your situation, your goals and, and what your plans are um, before you find a property that's going to meet those. <laughs> yep and okay folks we made things sound a bit complicated right and Did it I? is Sorry. complicated the, po the point is it's a big decision there are things that you need to do in a certain sequence to get to the right answer right if you do try and cut corners the risk is you end up with a suboptimal decision and to bring my punctilia action back again right you make a decision you do something and then the consequences follow right if you haven't done the work and if you've not actually got yourself aligned appropriately, you end up with a situation that haunts you subsequent. And a lot of the mortgage stress that I see in my surveys stems directly from people making bad decisions for the reasons that we've discussed this evening. So um, very, very important conversation. And Megan, I want to say thank you very much for sharing your expertise with us. It's been really um, interesting and exciting to hear what's going on and uh, your views there. If people want to find out more about you and what you do, where's the best place for them to go? Uh, look, there's there's two options. If you're interested in the um, help with buying property in Brisbane, it's www.propertypursuit.com.au. Um, if you're actually interested in upskilling yourself or finding out how to go through this process in a really methodical way, um, homebuyeracademy.com.au is the online course that we've created, um, particularly for first home buyers, to really arm you with information, help you through the process.
Yeah, thanks. And I will say that I've had a few people that I've done one-on-one -on -one sessions with who've gone through that first time by a course and uh, they rave about it. So it, right. it comes with a lot of um, enthusiasm and uh, a, a lot of people saying it really has helped. So I re recommend that uh, people go look. Thank you. Lovely. And I'm so grateful to be on again. It's lovely having another discussion with you. Great. Well, I've enjoyed it too. So thank you very much and uh, keep safe. And I'm sure we'll do it again. Um, you know, as things develop, there's always plenty more to talk about when, in, when property is involved, right? Never ends. Who knows what happens in the next few months? Can't <laughs> wait to see it. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. I want to take you offline now and close the show. Cheerio. So there we are, folks. That was um, great to uh, chat with Megan and, uh, you know, such an expert in, in her field and uh, I think has such a wonderfully balanced view. So um, just want to say that next week uh, we're going to switch uh, to another conversation. I've got Robbie Barwick from uh, the Citizens Party coming on. We're going to talk about what I've called It's the Economy, Stupid. So we're going to talk about what should be done versus what's being done, what the implications are. Should be a fun session and uh, feel free to join us the same time next week. So Mike Yadar is there. Uh, other than that, I want to say thank you very much for spending your Tuesday evening with us and for uh, asking some great questions. And uh, I'll look forward to seeing you during the week or next week on the live show. This is Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics signing off. Cheerio.